Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we jump into this new episode, we'd like to take a moment and thank you for your continued support. Many of you asked how you can support us. One great way is to subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter. Each month, we collect and curate information about the latest scientific advances in the field, as well as biotech and pharmaceutical news. Subscribe today at drgpcr.com newsletter. We would also like to hear from you. Please take a moment to tell us how to make Dr. GPCR work for you by filling out any of our surveys on drgpcr.com survey. You can tell us what you think about the podcast, the summit, and even Dr. GPCR in general. Stay tuned as we are working on the 2022 Dr. GPCR Summit Edition. And we also have been busy working on a brand new secret project. Visit drgpcr.com to find out more about all our activities. And now, let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Samina from Dr. GPCR. For today's podcast episode, I am happy to welcome Dr. Marta Felizola. Uh, she and I just met a few minutes ago before we hit record, and I'm so excited to have her with us today. Hi, Marta. Thank you for having me, Yanina. I'm and so excited nice to talk you. to you today. Yes, <laughs> nice to meet you. Hopefully with, with COVID, you know, uh, being more under control, we'll get a chance to meet at a conference uh, in person too. Looking forward to it. Fantastic. So can you, um, let's start off by the, with the obvious how did you become a scientist? So, so the obvious is actually also the, the most trivial. Uh, I, uh, I really liked uh, chemistry in high school. I really loved my teacher. She was a tough one, but a very good one, very uh, uh, precise in instructions and the things that she wanted to uh, hear you learn. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the discipline. I liked it, and I decided to take it for uh, um, you know forward for my uh, um, bachelor degree. Um, as you can uh, guess from my accent, I am originally from uh, uh, Italy. Uh, I am uh, uh, from Naples, and I did my undergrad there uh, at the University of Naples. I got my degree in uh, in uh, chemistry. I I was uh, very interested at the time in structural biology, and uh, and so I did my master's thesis uh, in uh, crystallography uh, of uh, bioactive peptides, not proteins. I didn't touch proteins at the time, <laughs> and uh, um, and so I I got my master's degree um, uh, also at the University of Naples, and then uh, I moved to. Spain uh, to do my uh, uh, PhD, although the majority of uh, so the majority of time was in Spain, but the the title is Italian because the Italian government was paying for my uh, uh, grant for my uh, fellowship. Um, in Spain, I was at uh, the uh, University Polytechnic of Catalonia, uh, where I um, met a professor who had just. Um, come back from uh, from uh, the United States and uh, had been uh, um, involved in uh, uh, computational biology of uh, GPT and couple receptors. And so we started talking and I felt it was a very interesting topic. And uh, and basically I, uh, I started uh, focusing my um, PhD thesis uh, on uh, um, uh, G protein copy receptor building actually homology model. Actually, it was molecular modeling models, so not even homology models. There were ab initial models of a G protein copy receptor. At the time, there, there was no crystal structure, if you can believe that. <laughs> so there were these uh, um, EM uh, maps from Yara uh, uh, Schertler. Uh, and basically, we were uh, uh, building. Uh, um, models of uh, helices based on uh, tilting that we could infer from uh, you know these uh, two-dimensional uh, maps and so we, we developed a software uh, program that would allow us to build a three-dimensional model uh, starting you know, with this information the relative position of the helices based on these maps and the tilting of the helices based on these maps 
And uh, that was the uh, um, topic or the main topic, I should say, of my thesis because then using that software, we developed models of some of the GPCRs in particular. I was interested in vasoactive intestinal peptide, which is VIP, it was you know, very important. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's also a very important peptide, exactly. Right. A very important GPCR. So basically, my yep. my uh, my thesis was mostly on that, and also some uh, um, modeling of opioid receptors, which became my uh, first love, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and the uh, uh, the one that I have pursued. Uh, Further in my research, moving uh, you know from uh, my postdoc and my future career. So let's let's say I think I think you're one of the first or maybe the second guest uh, who really is more of a who has a more chemistry like uh, orientation. Mm -hmm. uh, no pun intended at all. Uh, but as as a, as a teenager, as a child, I know you mentioned that you liked chemistry. Did you think, did you ever think that you'd be a scientist or a researcher? Actually not, <laughs> to, be, to be honest with you. I mean, I think that uh, um, I, maybe I was naive or <laughs> I was more naive than others. I don't know. I, I just enjoyed, you know, what I was uh, hearing or, or the... Um, or it came very um, natural to me to uh, look at, uh, you know, molecules interacting and uh, guessing how they would interact, what strength of association they would have. And so, um, so it, it, it was, you know, it was not something that, you know, when I was a child, I would say, oh, I would want to be a scientist. When I was in high school, I started developing a lot for, uh, for the discipline. But uh, um, I would not have predicted, uh, you know, to have a career as a, as a scientist. Obviously, obviously, when you start doing a PhD and everything else, then, you know, then things change, and especially when you continue with the postdoc and, uh, and, uh, and, the with, and then when you go to academia even more, right? Yeah. But, uh, but it's, uh, it's not something, it was not, uh, uh, you know, uh, really... Uh, um, uh, thought out <laughs> that carefully from the beginning. Was did you want to do something else as a child? Did you imagine, or did you didn't have any ideas? But it depends when when you are referring to child because when it when I was two years old, or three years old, maybe I wanted to be a ballerina. <laughs> Who knows? You know, I'm I'm thinking more more around ten to ten, between ten and fifteen. No, I don't know. I mean, uh, between ten and fifteen, I I. I don't know. I maybe I was seeing myself uh, um, in, uh, um, you know, in a teaching environment, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily science related, uh, or at least I did not have uh, all this uh, um, this understanding of what I wanted to yeah. become one day. Um, so maybe I'm more of a, a late boomer. <laughs> on this, on this, <laughs> I don't know, but the uh, I think that the the realization of what I liked really came in high school rather than uh, uh, earlier. But that's okay too. For a long time, well, I, for for a very long time, I didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> I just happened to to pick uh, my my uh, undergrad or my bachelor's program based on the fact that biochemistry starts with a B and chemistry starts with a C. So I went with biochemistry <laughs> first. I would have been a very poor chemist, to be honest. Uh, I, ju I just don't understand. It just doesn't work. I cannot see things in space. Uh, you have to show me and then maybe I'll get it, but definitely, definitely not, not chemistry savvy. Although as uh, um, the, uh, what's his name? Mr. Mr. White would say in, uh, Breaking Bad, that the chemistry must be respected, and I, I truly believe that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> well, nowadays I might, might, I might say that it might be a little bit uh, easier than uh, at uh, uh, my time when we were trying to uh, understand, you know, reactions and things from uh, books. Nowadays, all of the uh, um, great uh, um, educational material that you get through videos or, you know, it's much, much simpler and it's getting better and better. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, kids nowadays don't really read books or they don't want to yeah. see books. So at least not my YouTube kids. <laughs> <laughs> videos. I, I sometimes do the same too when I'm looking for some information. First thing I do is I see if there is a YouTube video. 
Yeah. Because if it's a protocol or anything, then you just watch the, you can read the, the protocol, but it's not the same thing. It has a different, different feel to it. Yeah. So you, you completed your, your PhD mm-hmm. and then, uh, what next? What happened next? How did you decide? First of all, let's take a step back. How did you, why did you decide to pursue a PhD? And after that, once you've completed your PhD, what, what made you decide to move forward in an academic path, career path? Right. So, so for the PhD, um, I think that, uh, you know, I was at the end of the, uh, when I, when I finished my bachelor, I really did not know exactly whether I wanted to go to work for uh, industry or academia. or uh, And so I had uh, the opportunity to have uh, a uh, uh, fellowship to go study abroad, which was Spain. And, uh, and the fellowship was actually for something related to um, crystallography. So I was supposed to go and learn about crystallography of uh, proteins, actually, in Spain. And then uh, I, um, I started, you know, a- a exploring the computational field, and I liked it more. And I say, well, I have to learn more. I have to understand better how this works. And it was obviously a change in uh, what I had been uh, exposed to when I was in, uh, uh, in, uh, um, you know, in, in during the, my undergrad. And so I had no other option than say, okay, maybe a PhD is a good uh, uh, way to learn more about this field that I want to, uh, you know, understand better. And uh, um, and, and so that, that that was the reason. Then, then I felt, uh, you know, uh, I was. Um, in Spain, in Spain, obviously, uh, I would not necess- necessarily speak that much in English because I learned Spanish as soon as I arrived. And I felt that I really needed to have an experience in uh, an English speaking country. Uh, <laughs> and so, and so basically, I, uh, I came to the States to work, um, for a very uh, small research institute in the Bay Area of San Francisco. The um, head of this institute was uh, Gilda Lowe, uh, who was a pioneer in, in quantitative uh, uh, chemistry uh, and uh, um, in quantum chemistry, sorry, and uh, um, before 50 and uh, things like that. So basically, I, I joined uh, her uh, institute, her small institute, the name was Molecular Research Institute, though we were uh, often uh, uh, joking that it was my research institute because it was a Gilda's <laughs> research institute. Uh, but the truth is that it was a very small environment. Uh, however, I learned a lot from that small environment uh, because Gilda, Gilda was, you know, really touching two different fields, the ligand-based drug discovery uh, field mm-hmm. and the structure-based drug discovery field. So I had an opportunity coming from more the structural biology environment to understand more about the ligand-based drug design. And uh, um, and so I spent a couple of uh, years there since actually her death. So she unfortunately got uh, uh, ill. She got cancer, and uh, uh, and basically at that point, uh, you know, I was in the states with uh, a postdoctoral advisor who couldn't, you know, send any uh, supporting letter. The only person who knew me through Gilda was actually Arel Weinstein, who. Um, uh, was the chair of the Department of Physiology and Biophysics at the, at the time here at Mount Sinai uh, in New York. And so basically, Ariel offered me a position as an instructor in, uh, uh, in his lab, and that was the transition to mm-hmm. academia. Um, and, uh, um, and so I, I worked with Ariel uh, for uh, several years, for no, maybe six years, uh, in the meantime, he, he moved to uh, Wild Medical College or Cornell University, so I uh, followed him there. And then uh, I started, uh, you know, uh, challenging myself with uh, grant writing uh, and all the, uh, you know, all the usual. Uh, and uh, and so I, I, at some point, you know, I I had my my grants, I had my funding, I had my uh, own labs, but but basically I was still um, 
somehow associated with Arel, right? Because he was yeah. the chair of the department, and uh, and uh, and so it was difficult to, to understand really the difference between uh, Marta pre, uh, you know, pre 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 uh, <laughs> position, uh, independent position, and post independent position. So, so I talked to Arel. Arel, Arel has always been the uh, best mentor ever, and uh, uh, and he was uh, extremely supportive. Uh, and uh, basically, I told him, you know, maybe we have to cut our umbilical cord, <laughs> so I have to go somewhere else. And uh, uh, and he was really supportive uh, and gave me lots of uh, good insight. He still does, you know. I still call Arel, <laughs> you know, when you have a mentor, he's a mentor for life. So um, anyway, so. So I um, I basically uh, started in interviewing for an independent position. This was in uh, 2006, I would assume. And, uh, uh, and then a position uh, became available here at uh, Mount Sinai, which was a place I knew because I had been here previously. The uh, department was undergoing uh, a uh, change because it was changing from... Uh, uh, physiology and biophysics to structural and chemical biology at the time. Nowadays, it's called the pharmacological sciences because of another merge that it underwent. And uh, and basically, uh, you know, I interviewed also at Sinai and in the end, uh, they offered me a position. Of course, it was a very um, natural and uh, uh, comfortable environment because I knew several people here, um, wonderful co colleagues and a wonderful chair. And so basically, I uh, I came to Sinai in 2006 or seven six as uh, an independent uh, um, investigator, uh, you know, an assistant professor level, and then I I moved, you know, the uh, uh, the career ladder to associate and and, and full professor, uh, uh, and I've been uh, you know here since then. That's great. And then the, during your postdoc, and you're moving from from the San Francisco Bay to Cornell to Mount Sinai and back and forth, were you always working on GPCRs? Um, I actually was. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I can tell you more, I was working on opioid receptors the full time, although you know I was having some distraction with the other subtypes. <laughs> But the reality is that uh, you know I was uh, mostly focused on uh, G protein coupling receptors. So, so I had a little uh, you know a, 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 a little gap with uh, with uh, um, uh, Gilda in uh, also working on people with the and, uh, and other stuff. But the reality is that uh, uh, you know my my focus uh, my emphasis uh, remained on uh, on GPCRs. Um, even at the ligand based, uh, uh, you know, drug design level, it was so focused on molecules that were targeting GPCRs. Um, so, so it, it, it's it's funny because when I was at um, uh, Molecular Research Institute, then um, you know the the focus by that time you know, was 1998 that I joined uh, MRI. The first structure, and I was there until 2001, I believe. And uh, the uh, uh, first structure of GPCR, as you know, uh, was in August of 2000. And so I remember that very well <laughs> because I say, shoot, all my models <laughs> are ruined. <laughs> right? And so basically, I... Um, um, I remember that I was talking to Gilda and, uh, and I was saying, you know, I mean, now this is huge, you know, I mean, it's a structure of Egyptia, all the, you know, all the modeling now becomes homology models of, uh, uh, you know, uh, templates and the drawdops, you know, it's not that similar to an opioid receptor or other stuff. So, and so we started thinking, you know, what else also we can start thinking about, to, you know, where to use modeling and how to use modeling. And so at the time there was uh, this, uh, um, you know, there was this new uh, um, literature that started talking about dimerization of GPCRs, of this other, right? I mean, so, so the, the problem became not only building one single protomer, one single model, but it was to build uh, dimers and how you would build them, you know, at which interface yeah. and so on and so on. So Gilda told me, you know, you should work on that. 
and uh, and I say, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> as, as the problem was not enough with the one GPC. But anyway, but the, the reality is that, uh, you know, I became interested in uh, in the GPCR dimerization. And uh, and uh, I think that uh, my lab was among the first who was, which were starting, uh, you know, to, to build models of, of uh, um, GPCR dimers. Then I started also working with uh, uh, Jonathan Javich, who was uh, very interested at the time uh, in uh, um, in uh, uh, you know, associations, and his, his, his uh, first law for uh, for the GPCRs is a dopamine receptor. But basically, uh, you know, we were uh, working in any case uh, with. Uh, with uh, models that were based on uh, on available templates, and at the time it was still relapsed, right? Then it was yeah. much later in two thousand and seven that we had, uh, you know, all the other uh, the others, you know, the beginning of all the others. Yep, um, <laughs> exactly. I feel like yeah, there was the two thousands, the Rodopsin, uh, the Pachevsky paper, and after that there was just the others. <laughs> all the others, and, and then all the others, though they included the uh, opioid receptors. Yeah. You know, so, so basically, when uh, when the opioid receptors uh, uh, came about, uh, you know, as a structure, it was extremely exciting for me because basically, I was, uh, you know, we were always fantasizing on these models and how they would, uh, you know, be interacting and uh, what do they, you know, how they looked like. So it was nice to have uh, a structure uh, to use as a reference because, in any case, I mean, as you know. Uh, you know, it's it's a snapshot, right? This is just one uh, one frame of uh, of uh, uh, an entire uh, uh, movie there. So so basically, um, we started uh, um, focusing now more on uh, uh, drug discovery because basically having uh, you know structural models that have some experimental validation is always better. Um, and we started challenging ourselves there for. Uh, um, predicting binding of molecules of uh, um, opioid receptors, I'm sorry, opioid ligands uh, that were uh, more at, within a typical uh, chemical scaffold than uh, the uh, regular, you know, uh, alkaloids or morphinans and things like that. And so for that, of course, you know, the, the problem was even more uh, complex because uh, we couldn't rely really on the structures. The structures uh, were uh, with the morphinans until uh, you know Damgo uh, came about. But the uh, um, the uh, reality is that these new scaffolds you would not know necessarily how they would bind. So so the um, so so docking, uh, you know, as you know, the molecular docking has the. the it's a, it's a limitations in terms of uh, scoring functions, uh, how approximate they are, and so we started uh, pushing uh, hard on uh, on molecular dynamic simulations uh, to try to uh, predict better uh, uh, poses or more reliable poses. Uh, of the ligands. Obviously, you know, molecular dynamic simulation also has its uh, own limitations, and so you can't really start from a duct molecule and then just simulate because it, it will stay there forever. And so we uh, basically started uh, uh, exploring uh, these enhanced sampling algorithms that will allow us to uh, really explore several different events of binding of these uh, uh, ligands and eventually even uh, to predict, uh, you know, kinetics of the ligands. I mean, this is the most recent work that we have been doing. So, so we um, we started exploring, uh, you know, different uh, algorithms and different strategies. But one that we um, beat to death basically it was meta dynamics, and uh, and uh, and we used. We used it primarily for uh, binding and also for uh, to predict. Uh, um, activation pathways of the GPCR, right? Because in, in at, at the time, yes, we had structures, but then it was uh, uh, more of a question of what what these ligands or which ligands will be stabilizing a specific conformation and what that conformation would recognize more a G protein or an arrest, right? And then you know all the story about the function yeah. of selectivity or not. We want to have a GPCR that or a, or a, or a molecule that is stabilizing a GPCR that would preferentially 
um, recruit Ciprotin instead of arresting and eventually, you know, avoid side effects that might be um, obtained by um, recruitment or arrest. Uh, however, you know, this depends on the on the gypsy, it depends on uh, several different things. And uh, as you know, you know, depending on whether uh, uh, you are looking at this in vitro, in vivo, you might have a different uh, result. You know, you, you have uh, uh, interviewed enough people <laughs> <laughs> there and the experts in the field to know exactly you know what I'm talking about but that, that's 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 still fantastic I think it's a it's a different way I, I love how how you you walked through all the types of approaches that you explored in order to you know um, better understand how to modulate receptor function from a computational perspective and I love that you mentioned that you know this has limitations that has limitations but I think putting together all those methodologies is going to allow to to get more answers absolutely and, and, and using one so, sorry and, and and in uh, in uh, always uh, in uh, uh, integrated with uh, experimental uh, uh, evidence right I mean let's face it I mean the the and, and I'm a computational you know, person. So obviously, I have to, uh, you know, defend my field. But the reality is that in the end, we are playing with models, right? And so we have approximations. So um, of course, there are uh, uh, approximations also when you have uh, uh, experiments. But the reality is that you have to feed that information back into loops to be able to uh, improve your models with the experimental information and inform experiments with your models, right? So um, in that, I have always been very lucky to have wonderful, um, you know, experimental colleagues that have helped us, um, you know, either test our models or or test our hypothesis or, or again, give us information for um, making better models. Now, uh, nowadays, I don't know whether, you know, the field is going to, with all these structures, you know, more, more cryo-EM structures and all of this, you know, at some point, uh, We'll have also to think of ways to uh, better uh, inform the chemistry and better inform the uh, design of molecules, right? Of course, all these structures are gold for us, right? And uh, uh, even the cryo EM structures that might be less uh, resolved in the binding pockets, uh, but still that is an, a, an extremely important information uh, that we can use as a starting point to uh, uh, refine um, you know, molecules and to design better compounds. Now the question is whether we can use now all this information to um, maybe predict uh, novel uh, chemical matters, right? And and whether uh, we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches to try and uh, generate new molecules so that uh, are uh, relying on the data that 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 are you know that are available. Now the, the challenge there is that you know when you look even at the in vitro data of binding assays you know it can be all over the place depending on uh, what is the uh, hot ligand that you are using, or whether uh, you know what is the lab <laughs> that did this. Exactly. You know, there is a, there is a lot of challenge there, right? And so the um, the question is whether uh, we as a community should uh, really uh, put our uh, heads together and have data that can be. Um, used in a really a predictive manner and uh, um, and allow to explore these new methodologies that would learn from data to predict uh, new new things, right? So 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 we'll see whether that will matter. We are not there. <laughs> we are absolutely not there. But uh, you know, eventually um, we will uh, get closer. I I think that's that's something that. You know, I was watching a webinar the other day and someone was presenting those response curves and they specifically said, oh, we use this kit. Mm -hmm. And and my thought was, OK, so there is no database as to, you know, standardized fashion, independently, whether you do an experiment in Europe, in Australia, using this methodology, you would get every time the same response. And that's one big problem 
for experimental biologists, but also for computational and machine learning, because you don't know what info, what's the input. Absolutely, and and uh, and again, I mean, you can curate some, but uh, but it's uh, you know, it's not yeah. easy. It's not an easy thing. So 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 we'll see if we will, you know, at some point we will have to have a community, um, you know, effort in this, and so uh, so we'll see if uh, if it will become productive. My my prediction is that it will be, and it will allow us to better integrate. Uh, what we learn from computation, we do what uh, we get through, through experiments. I think that would, that absolutely would be ideal uh, right. to, to get that information. So I asked this from everyone, and I think I know the answer to this, but what is your favorite GPCR? Well, I, I mentioned up here <laughs> more than <laughs> once. So I, my first law was mu up here receptor. And, uh, you know, I couldn't say that uh, it, uh, it is not still the same. I mean, see, it, it, that, that is definitely my favorite GPCR. Now, I have other GPCRs that I work uh, on, but the, if I had to tell you, you know, what what was my first law, certainly, you know, the uh, new opioid receptor. We, we talked about this a little bit, you know, you mentioned, you know, the, the lack of, um, of experimental data, enough data that you can very easily use and combine that data with computational methods to predict, uh, you know, a new chemical entity binding that hopefully you would select a confirmation of a receptor and the, the opioid receptor. What other tools are we missing? What else do we need in order to, you know, one morning with a cup of coffee, very easily say, oh, today I'm going to be uh, designing an antagonist for the opioid receptor. Yeah, I wish I had a, a clear answer for you. I don't because if I had it, uh, I would have already designed the antagonist, <laughs> for instance, of a cup of your receptor. No, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's not it's not easy, right? The uh, um, even when we are, uh, uh, you know, designing, for instance, uh, a uh, or uh, uh, testing a binding pocket, for instance, right? We often do it uh, through mutagenesis, right? But the reality is that we are, even if we infer what we get as a result from the mutagenesis, so we don't have a direct evidence that, in fact, you know, a specific change is happening or a specific interaction is missing. Or at least it's not that simple, right? Or you should have more than one control to, uh, to uh, um, determine that. So having, uh, um, you know, um, uh, experimental methods or biophysics methods that will allow us to produce maybe more of one structure, or maybe more of uh, one conformi conformation in different uh, type of environments uh, uh, and, and in, in, uh, in, a fastest, in a faster way, might be, uh, you know, one thing that is uh, still uh, missing, uh, having, uh, you know, more precise ways to um, to uh, um, measure the conformational changes and the extent uh, of conformational changes, right? You often have probes that uh, are, uh, you know, perturbing a little bit the, uh, the response that you, you get. And so, so having a more uh, precise uh, biophysics methods uh, perhaps is, uh, is, what, uh, is one of the things that, uh, that, that would be helpful. Yeah. You mentioned uh, you know, the fact that a structure is just a snapshot out of, the, out of a movie. And to, to kind of follow up on that, now that you were, you were talking about the different confirmations kind of we would need a slow motion movie of how the receptor gets activated in 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 a ways that the, the receptor is not too modified so that it can be more of a wild type like behavior and really take those back to back to back snapshots that would lead from inactive to to active state right. in the present and, and you you but can uh, so, somehow uh, do that so you know with the, with the molecular dynamics simulations uh, um, although again using several different tricks not not standard molecular dynamics simulation because even the transformation between inactive and and active receptor is large enough that that it's it's impossible to get it in uh, in the microsecond scale simulations so um, but. You know, it's it's a it's a question then how you use that information uh, 
back into the design of the molecule, right? I mean, if you really want to design a biased agonist to say something, you know, how can I use the dynamic information? How can I extract the relevant information from the dynamic information back into the design of the uh, uh, chemical, right? I mean, that is... Uh, uh, still challenging. It's still, uh, you know, uh, not really straightforward. Yes, we can infer, well, it's this helix that is moving and then it's this residue that is doing this and that. But the reality is that, you know, it's, it's based on uh, hypothesis. So there is no evidence that this is happening because there are no precise methods from an experimental viewpoint that would allow you to capture all these uh, different steps, right? Uh, or at least, you know, there are several that are uh, um, from the structural biology field that are emerging, yeah. but we are uh, still, uh, you know, not there, not as, you know, as as, as fast and as uh, productive as we would want to, to be. Even for uh, for cryo EM, you know, I mean, the the, uh, thought that we will be able to uh, obtain structures with all possible ligands, uh, in uh, you know, dependent on their affinity or whatever, it's it's not realistic, right? So we will have to again use combinations of uh, computation and experiments to inform uh, our uh, our design. I love that, and and the way sometimes when I think about um, you know wet lab experiments versus computational. It's to me, it seems to be to be the same coin. It's just different sides, and they're just complementary. Um, and I think that's that's something that has become more and more obvious over the years. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I remember. I still remember since I, you know, as I told you, I when I started, I started as a, a structural biologist, and then you know, structural biology really could not talk to computation people because <laughs> they, didn't they didn't believe them, right? I mean, we were able to simulate the time on the pickle cycle, <laughs> which was you know ridiculous. At the same time, uh, the computational uh, people would read these uh, structural biology papers where the discussion was an entire speculation of movements that were happening of which they had no proof for side. So, you know, I guess that now at least we have uh, uh, more, um, um, you know, more of a chance to talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. I think, I think the fact that, you know, the, the, um, when, when you look at experiments measuring directly in cell-based assays, receptor function, we've come such a long way. When I started out, we were measuring cyclic EMP by purifying cyclic EMP, radioactive labeled cyclic EMP on two sets of columns and you would go and it was a competition and now you can do it in, in live cells, plate-based, 384, you name it. And But then this side of you know automation and doing live cells and uh, high throughput has come such a long way, but at the same time, I think computed from the computational standpoint, with the avenue of all of these structures, um, there was there was a uh, the, the two roads finally met, Absolutely. and I think using that information and as you mentioned, going into loops and feeding that had that feedback loop mm -hmm. is what's going to get us closer to uh, to what we're looking for information wise. Yeah. yeah. So yes, so so very exciting. I mean, it's a still, uh, you know, it's 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 science, right? It never ends. <laughs> exactly. That's 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 true. Especially when when you're a trainee, you could stay there for twenty years because the project never really ends. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, and 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 actually the um, the interesting thing is that you know is 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 the realization that. Uh, it's it's a fact that it's an evolution, right? That 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 you are always challenging what you had learned, and because at some point what you learned becomes obsolete, and you have to do something different. Also, it's, it it requires lots of creativity uh, and uh, and lots of uh, you know re. Uh, vamping and restarting uh, all the time, uh, which uh, you know sometimes is uh, tiring. <laughs> but, it is. but you know, I mean, it depends on uh, on uh, on uh, how much uh, 
how, how you really crazy you are in, the, <laughs> in sticking I, to the to the uh, to the uh, uh, problem. I think we we all have this um, this need for for that dopamine rush, and we go from paper to paper, and then you have to really carefully use that dopamine rush from paper one to paper two because true. it's the desert in between. True, true. Which gets me to to my next uh, question, and I ask this from everyone: is we've talked a little bit now about the fact that you know you need to have that resolve, and you have to be a little bit crazy to continue working on these projects and and revamp. What would be your advice for, for junior scientists who would like to contribute to the GPCR field from a computational standpoint, for example? Oh, from a computational standpoint. So, yeah. I don't know, for sure to enter it with uh, an open mind, but uh, uh, but also with uh, uh, a, um, a realization that, uh, that it's important to... Um, to to establish the uh, uh, appropriate uh, um, collaborations uh, so as that whatever uh, new prediction or new model that you are working on cannot be really um, addressed and validated by uh, by other investigators. So it's important to um, to start with. Uh, with an understanding that you are not going to work alone, basically. That the uh, that it's not that you will be doing only computational uh, work. It's not just development of methods, right? I mean, uh, mm-hmm. so, so when you enter the computational field, at least from my standpoint, the computational biology or biophysics uh, field, you either enter it from a development perspectives and so you are interested in developing methods uh, you know developing a, a website whatever right I mean whatever thing you want to to do or from an applicational perspective if you are interested in uh, uh, understanding better how the uh, GPCR is working if you are interested in designing a drug if you are interested in uh, um, uh, integrating all the information that you can get from uh, experiments to make new molecules you really need to take into account that you cannot work by yourself for doing your uh, computation uh, and publish your computational paper without any experimental uh, validation in it or any uh, insight from uh, from experiments so so a, a computational person who enters this world especially now with all these structures and all these things need to have uh, um, an understanding that it's a collaborative work and that you need to establish interactions uh, with uh, others in the field to move the field forward I love that. So basically being able to communicate, not only in equations and also being able to learn the, the other side of other side of the coins language when it comes to um, data that's um, experimental data tested in the lab. And make sure also that uh, the other people understand your language, right? Because if you stick and, you know, if you remain too, uh, theoretical and uh, and too uh, and too uh, abstract. Um, the experimentalists might not understand what you are talking about. They might not be interested, right? So you, you need to um, gain their interest and their um, so that they can contribute their knowledge uh, to you, right? So it's so it's a, it's a two way situation. It's two two different languages, and everyone needs to learn the other language for for the for the partnership to work. Right, right. We've talked uh, about about your work, about opioid receptors. Were there ever um, any aha moments in your career as a scientist that you know made you either realize, oh wow, I've learned something, or oof, uh, we dodged a bullet because we took a different way? Any any aha moments? Any highlights that you can think of? Well, the the aha moments, maybe I already uh, mentioned them. Certainly, you know, when we got the first uh, crystal structure of uh, of a GPCR, it changed the direction of uh, several of us who were uh, mostly involved in molecular modeling. And uh, and, uh, um, so so, so that is definitely, you know, a... um, 
change in direction. Another one was perhaps with the with the uh, realization that these these receptors may or may not, depending on who you talk to, uh, dimerize or oligomerize, and uh, how complex that. Uh, you know, uh, is in terms of molecular mechanisms because again, now you have two entities, and you have two or more entities, and then you have them working with uh, you know gibberellin. So how many gibberellin? So so it's uh, it's you know it, it escalates to the uh, uh, to, to the complexity and it escalates the problem. Um, so um, so the the other uh, realization or the other uh, ha ha moments are definitely you know what you learn every day right I mean uh, whether or not you need to uh, focus on uh, um, on uh, understanding functional selectivity or whether or not uh, you should uh, uh, pursue an aesthetic uh, uh, modulation in order to achieve what you want to achieve so it's it, it, you know ha ha moments in science happen. <laughs> all, the, all the time, right? And it depends on what what makes it, you know, you excited and what what makes you decide to change to change directions. Lovely, lovely. All right. Last but not least, uh, if you have job openings, uh, where can people find you? All right. Now, actually, I just posted. <laughs> <laughs> a position <laughs> in my lab. Actually, I have two positions open in my lab, and uh, I uh, um, I I usually use uh, you know Twitter a lot, uh, um, but I have also posted on uh, Job Archive and uh, uh, LinkedIn. So these are the uh, uh, actually no, it's not true. I have also posted in CCL CCL CCL. Dot net, which was uh, one of uh, you know the uh, very old sites, mostly European, I would, I would assume, mm -hmm. where uh, where computational jobs are uh, uh, posted in computational biology. So that 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 site is also um, one that I uh, usually use. But the uh, the one that is most active right now, I think, is uh, the uh, uh, or the one from which I'm receiving more more, more, more applications is uh, LinkedIn. Well, I invite you to uh, visit drgbcr.com slash career. We have a form. Feel free to to uh, to fill it out, and we will be happy to put it on our I website. I didn't realize and that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we will also uh, start spreading the word on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, and uh, and Facebook. Oh, that is lovely. Yeah, That's that. lovely. Hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll find you uh, great candidates. Oh, yeah. I, I Thank you so much. <laughs> of course, of course. That, that was a very good news. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have. So one of the reasons why I thought about the career page is because as, as a PhD or as a postdoc, you don't know what's out there. Sure. And sometimes, especially when it comes to industry positions, sometimes they don't tell you GPCR is in the job description. There are these big words about, you know, immuno-oncology or cancer and and obviously the underlying, you know, one of the targets or something has to do with GPCRs. But if you, as a scientist, want to continue working on GPCRs, the keyword is GPCR. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree. So, I did not know of this, uh, of this uh, uh, link that you are uh, referring to. So uh, please share it. <laughs> I will. I will. I will share it with you by email. With this, Marta, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed our chat. Thank you, Yamina. It has been a pleasure. And thanks for having me. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We'd like to thank our guest, as well as our team members, Attila Forrest, Ines Pinero, and Alexa Truan. Please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter today and find us on YouTube as well. If you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe. Mm -hmm.